The 6.5 is on the road here in Las Vegas. We're at Dell Tech World 2025. It has been a great event so far. And we heard, we're hearing about hardware, software, wrapping the bow around services. And oh, shocking, we're talking a lot about AI here. Well, we knew that was going to happen coming into this, Pat, but it's been a year uh, of just continual innovation, continued progress. Last yeah. year at Dell Technologies World, we heard a lot. The AI factory was in full bloom. But we knew that you got to keep on innovating. I mean, think about how far, how fast we've come. Last year we were talking about generative AI. This year we're talking about agents. We're talking about physical AI. We're yeah. talking about taking it to the edge, bringing it on device. And we're getting a little bit of all that here. Yeah, we are. And in the end, it's about making it real for customers. And whether that's consumers, uh, enterprises, small and medium businesses, making it real. And that was actually, I would say, the theme of Jeff Clark's keynote that he gave today. And hey, surprisingly, we have Jeff on here to chat with him. Good to see you, my friend. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. I'll get you from <laughs> afar. Yeah, it's great to have you back. Um, you know, love making this a bit of an annual thing with you here. We, you we, have to, we have to start, though, with where Jeff was yesterday and where he is today. This is, a, just, this is I was actually about to make a, this is Agent Jeff. Okay. We don't have Jeff. <laughs> Jeff's still in Taipei. Um, <laughs> Now, Jeff, where are you? Part of him is. I mean, at least part of you, part of you is there. But I mean, this is one of those weeks where Dell and, of course, you got Computex, a whole bunch of your big partners have, are having events. This is a mega week, but you didn't just come back from overseas. I mean, your eyes are open, but are you here with us today? Are you feeling <laughs> I'm good? I'm with you. I was uh, at GTC yesterday. Jensen invited me to come out to speak at the pregame and reminisce on kind of the history of our industry. How do you say no? You can't, can't. It's hard. Can't say no to him now. <laughs> well, it's just a heck of an opportunity. Yeah. And then I kind of got in about eight o'clock last night, and I'm here today after a keynote. I'm glad this is well, real Jeff, not Agent Jeff, everybody. Yeah. So we're in. We got the real deal now. I we am are. looking forward to an agent doing my keynote in the future, <laughs> so I can mail it in. I think you need a sixth workflow for your AI journey. Jeff, so add that to it. We are very excited for the day that an agent can do all of our work, as long as we still keep it, get to keep all the money. Exactly. You know, that's, that's the part that we're, we're trying to sort out, though. But you know, as we talk about agents, right? He's just like, I, I'm with you. Um, you know, let's talk about this though a little bit because we have seen this proliferation. It's gone really quick. We're talking about trillions of tokens now. We're talking about systems talking to systems. We are talking about parts of our work yeah. being done autonomously with sometimes us in the loop, sometimes not in the loop. You were all about kind of bringing use cases and POCs to life in your, in your keynote. Talk a little bit about kind of how you see this agent evolution taking place and kind of what are the opportunities you're seeing open up, opening up for business? Sure, I think many leap to it's very complex and it's not well understood. I, I think of it, or tend to think of it very basic and I tried to carve out or illustrate a few examples today. Ultimately, we're creating a digital workforce. Yeah. And how does that digital workforce get enabled to do tasks? And we've been around the block long enough to reminisce that historically, product guys built products and services people built services. Yes. IT management people built IT management things. And then we left it to whomever to make it all work together. Yeah. And while we've become more sophisticated over time, there's still relatively three different fiefdoms or three different areas. What I tried to describe on stage today is that canvas becomes clean in the world of agents. Yeah. As we embed agents into our products, embed agents into our services, agents get embedded into the management or orchestration applications, they begin to work together and increasingly more so yeah. autonomously. That's powerful. I imagine now the intelligence inside a device, whether it's a large array, whether it's a cluster of GPUs, right. or a PC, yes. can now communicate it's having a problem proactively intercepted by a service agent, ours, to understand what's going on and dispatch a part before anybody needs to know. Right. It solves itself. Now extrapolate that to many other use cases. In our factory, we now have factory planners used to go around with clipboards, then they advance to Excel. As we digitize our supply chain, you can manage or imagine the orchestration of planning and forecasting being taken over by agents. Yeah. And then we actually augment that by putting 
a digital twin in place, that the agents between the two digital twins work in the scheduling, forecasting, and planning to do scenario what ifs. Right. Oh my gosh. Yes. Think about every sort of use case in business today, whether that's in a hospital, other forms of manufacturing, transportation, those processes today that are largely manually done with lots of manual handoffs get digitized and a set of digital workers work them. I, I think that's a game changer. It's yet another disruptive nature of generative AI and what's to come. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing it to life, Jeff. I mean, first of all, um, you're customer zero uh, for your technology. And I do feel like you st took an extra step forward with your disclosures on what you're actually doing. I know I appreciated it. I mean, Daniel and I go from, you know, we're like the tech clown show that goes from tech show to tech show. <laughs> and and we're, we're, hearing, we're hearing all these stories of how people are doing these things. And I thought yours was very easy to understand and also valuable. Um, I think three of us are very much tech optimists um, on, on what AI is going to do. Uh, I'm a history buff and I look at historically of the fear of certain technologies and what it actually ended up doing to society. And uh, net net, you know, 99 out of 100 uh, were a net positive. Um, of course. There's not a whole lot of people, well, I think um, I'd like to know just how, how are you looking at, or how does Dell get into the position to uh, progress humanity forward? Because I know it's more than just, I mean, the bottom line is important, but progressing humanity forward with AI. Well, think of the big outcomes that can come of this. Yeah. Do you think we can eventually cure cancer? Likely. Can we make disease go away? More than likely. How about those two? No, those are, those are uh, listen, I'm a tech optimist. Uh, you had me a generative AI, but I think more people need to look at the glass half full when it comes to this. The industrial revolution, uh, we were starving uh, in, and all working in fields. Then we had specialization inside of factories that, that uh, sped up the ability to make more food and make more electricity and make better drugs. And, but, but there were the same types of conversations then. Uh, no, think about what happened. You took a largely artisan uh, manufacturing, one, we built things by one. Yes. We had an agricultural society. We moved to the cities. We created this in, or as a byproduct of the Industrial Revolution. Yeah. You added power, steam, then electricity. You now begin to get scaled manufacturing. You reduce the cost of goods. Yes. More goods are produced and a cons uh, our, sorry, society consumes that. The byproducts of the social side of this became better. Working conditions became better over time. We retrained the workforce. That's what we did today. This is the same thing. I We're going to retrain a workforce. You have to be understand AI just as if you would have had to understand what was changing yeah. 300 plus years ago. Uh, this is that scale, that impact. How could you not like it and get excited about it? I think it's really exciting. Um we have, you know, my, my kids are in, well, my oldest are in college, my youngest is in elementary school. Let's not talk about how that happened. But like, you know, there's a lot of things that have come up though recently, Jeff, where it's like, you know, we'll talk about a car and, and someone will be like, well, you know, Matthew, my son, would you like that car? And I kind of look at him like, there won't be cars when you're driving. You know, <laughs> not the way, you're, you're not gonna drive in cars like I drove cars, you know, or like jobs, right? When we went to college, you know, we, a lot of us went to be an engineer, to be like, and you kind of look at how AI is changing things. So, you know, as techno optimists, it's like, I look at the future and I'm always using kind of this data point, uh, Jeff, that's like every industrial revolution has created more, not less jobs. Like history has always Correct. proven that. Having said that, every time we run into these industrial revolutions, even us, even the most optimistic kind of look at this and go like, I don't think I need an analyst anymore. <laughs> like, I think I can use deep research. And we joke, because there's obviously all this nuance, but like, when you but get- your role of analyst changed. Right. So the, some of the work you used to do may be replaced. Yeah. But then you will move to the next level of right. work. And you may be orchestrating the agents. You may yes. be d determining the rules. Yes. What outcomes you're looking for. You provide the conscience to, conscience to them and what behaviors they will follow. It's, un it's I, I think it's, 
it's a change. And people don't like change. We kind of like the way that it is. But you mentioned cars. It's highly unlikely in our children's generation, yeah. by the end of it, no one will drive a car anymore. Yeah. Everything will be an autonomous driving car. Will they be safer? Yes. Without question. Oh, I mean, look. They are today. We, we should all be super enthusiastic, but even the, you know, even the biggest technology optimists on the planet, um, you know, like an Elon Musk, you know, there's a little bit of that, what's the risk of AI? Like, we won't talk about the existential people, the world enders. I think we would largely agree on this stage that we don't agree with, with their, their beliefs. But we will make drug discovery better. We will make healthcare better. We will make education better. We'll, kids will learn in two hours a day what they used to take eight and 10 hours a day. How we reapply that time. You know, you do hear the people that are like, oh, we're gonna need UBI because there's no jobs. Everybody's gonna need to just make money while Optimus robots run around us and do all the stuff that we used to do. So I, I think there is a role though to play for companies like yours that has so much influence on society, that works with so many companies to help us paint that picture of this better future and the roles that, to Pat's question, that the humans have to play. I think, I think it's an increasingly interesting question that I think all of us would agree, and I'd love to get more of your take on this, it will end well, but it isn't as obvious because the yeah. changes happen so fast as to what all those new roles, new changes, what do doctors do when they have those hours back that they're not spending chasing the administrative and bureaucratic parts right. because not like, it's exciting, but it is, it's mysterious. Well, then you have policymakers that will have an opinion. Do we need policymakers? I don't know, do we? Hey, they don't think it's, uh, no, hey, I'm, I'm hey, on film. We're not, I'm not going down that rat hole. I, I am gonna, I'm going to take this conversation. Yeah, I'm going to dial on, this give back, me back on topic here. No, give me back um, on topic. So, Jeff, uh, there's been a lot of the themes here about making AI easier, right? I mean, this stuff is, is hard. Um, I know you love all your children uh, equally. Maybe you don't. Uh, but when it comes to your tech innovations that you're bringing out, how are you making AI easier for your customers? Well, I, I think there are a couple of maybe themes to think about. So one, all of the examples that I gave today, we've just talked about that we're internally applying AI to. Yeah. We've actually brought our professional services organization in at day zero. Yeah. And they've either helped us do assessments that we've built their skill and capability along our journey so they can take that to our customers. So the involvement of the folks that talk to our customers, they ultimately have to help them go, here's what an AI strategy is, here's what a data strategy is, here's how you cleanse your data, here's how you ingest your data, here's day two operations. They've learned from us doing it. And we've taken that out. And then we also work with a vast partner of a vast set of partners to bring that capability. So that's one element of this. The second element is everything that we've learned in building these large clusters in the world, we've actually scaled down into making it easier for enterprise to deploy the infrastructure. And then I think the other important element of this goes down the path of ultimately we have to make it easier. It's, it's, it's a mantra that I drive inside the organization Deploying AI needs to be easy and easier. So now think about how you take the technology, and I know this isn't the word, so I'm gonna make it up. We're gonna appliance eyes yeah. AI. Think about rag in a box, chatbot in a box, yes. agent in a box. Little box for little edge deployments, yeah. bigger box for data center, bigger, bigger boxes for hyperscalers, or we CSP type capabilities. We so then you begin to bring the integration of the software stack, the model stack, and the infrastructure to make it easier. Add blueprints, add a bunch of uh, lessons learned that you provide your customers, and that's the path and journey we're on. And it's going to extract itself so much quicker, right? Like, as I listen to you describe this, and we've had this talk, Pat, but like, in some ways, a Agentic becomes SaaS of the future. We've heard kind of lots of CEOs talking about the deprecation of kind of CRUD databases and software and then in the future agents will abstract new experiences in real time that'll basically be prompt generated enterprise tools. I mean, this is, you know, I, I don't know, what's your vision? I mean, I know we only got a couple of minutes here, but is this kind of, it seems like this is kind of how it's playing out is a lot of the tools and software we use are going to change very quickly. I, I think the tools are changing and SaaS is certainly being redefined. And certainly we believe that we've been saying this 
a number of times. AI follows the data. Data is created out in the wild. And customers are not going to want to part with what they believe is their intellectual property, their secret sauce, their trade secrets. And I think there's an abstraction of SaaS that a data plane is going to stay on prem. Yeah, one thing you definitely turn, turn the contrast ratio up, you and Michael, that I do appreciate it, by the way, because it's the truth, is that you don't have to put all the data up in the cloud to get all this magic. Now, Correct. just to be clear, every major hyperscaler, with the exception of Google, uh, is saying that the only place you can do the magic uh, had those conversations with the highest levels of these companies, and I firm, but I talked to every CIO I talked to and CEO that says, I am not truck loading everything uh, up there. And by the way, it's just bullshit. Well, we you can do this on prem if it's yeah. your proprietary information, something that you believe it's domain specific to you that makes you who you are. Yeah. Why would you ever part with it? I mean, we're in a position where much of the much of the world's mission critical data is stored on yeah. our storage products. That information is not going to be pumped up. Could you imagine the service example that I gave today that I put up in the public cloud, give my customer information away, right. what problems we're having, how we solve them, where the parts go? Right. We would never do that. Yeah, and, and the big, you know, one of the biggest things that I saw on, on your stage today was uh, creating your own platforms when you needed it. You have uh, the Dell data platform, and you know I've been ta like asking for that for three years, you delivered it, and thank you and your customers thank you, but you also brought in partners to do this. Right. Right, we had Cohere with North on stage. You have Gemini running their state-of-the-art models that are really good now, they weren't before, on-premises, unplugged and firewalled. And that's, that's important. Uh, spent some time with Aiden in the building blocks. Pulling the Cohere model on-prem. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, what you did with uh, Google, for instance, is you know, bringing Gemini to on-prem is a great example of how cloud uh, on-premises, you know, infrastructure providers can actually bring, it's, it's a kind of the, it's almost the opposite. You're know, bringing the generative AI to the data that lives on-prem. I mean, different stats, Pat, we've kicked these around. 99% of enterprise data hasn't been touched by AI. You, you know, um, most of enterprise data lives on-prem. I mean, the vast majority. So, I mean, those two data points alone, you, 83% you know. of all data is on-prem. <laughs> Half of it's out at the edge. I don't see that materially changing. Now, I'm not suggesting it's all on-prem either. Yeah, it's, right. We think it's hybrid. Yeah. There's a continuum. Companies will make conscious choices of what stays on-prem and what they're comfortable using outside of their four walls to be. That's how we've done it. That's what we model and foresee, and it's just so obvious from what we did in the cloud era that this happens again. Yeah. It's hybrid cloud. It's going to be hybrid AI. Jeff, is there anything we didn't ask you that you thought we would ask, that we should have asked, that you want to get out to all the all your customers, employees, potential customers? I mean, you didn't have a keynote to tell everyone yet, so. Well, maybe they missed the keynote. No, I'm kidding. We're, we're going to share this on our five. platforms. We got a lot of a lot of people watching. So. Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground. Okay. I appreciate the time today, as always. Yes. Let's make it fun. Make it real. Yes, absolutely. Thanks all for right, having Jeff. me. All right, Jeff. Well, thank you so much for joining us here on the 6.5. Let's do this often, let's do this more regularly. A lot to share, and by the way, it's changing so fast, so we want to make sure we get it out there for everybody. We'll be talking about physical AI and humanoids in a year. I think exactly. we'll be talking more about that. So, great year, great stuff. Thanks for joining us. And thank you, everybody, for being part of the 6.5 on the road here in Las Vegas at Dell Technologies World. We're going to take a little break, but we'll be back with you shortly.